Is it on? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here so early to learn about what can be a seemingly dense topic. Um, I will try to not bore you um, or to confuse you too much. Um, we will start with about 30 minutes. I might cut it about 25 to keep more time for questions. And then um, be sure to take notes. Um, and let's get started. So my name is Ariana Fowler. I work at Consensus. We are headquartered actually in Brooklyn. Um, and Consensus is a blockchain technology firm. I actually work on our social impact team. So we act as a social impact consultancy and advisory group. So today's session will be pretty straightforward, Blockchain 101. Um, a lot of the topics each could have about an hour to five hours worth of information and presentation on them. Like I said, we'll keep this very high level. Um, I will also be sending the slides afterwards so you can spend more time reading. And then if you want more information about anything we discuss, feel free to find me afterwards and I can give you a whole reading list and watch list for you to deep dive in more into. But we will talk about blockchain. Um, as mentioned earlier, blockchain has more use cases than just cryptocurrency. So while I will briefly mention cryptocurrency, I will talk about blockchain itself as a technology. Um, yeah, all of these very complex words in the second bullet seem kind of scary, but we won't get too into them. So why blockchain? So blockchain today, I thought, and thinking about why this presentation, why we were asked to be here, there are really three main points as to why this is important. The first is innovation. We as individuals, you as governments, you as representatives, want to make sure that your countries and your companies and your organizations and your citizens are innovating constantly. You don't want to be left behind. Um, and blockchain is the hot topic. It is the new trend. Um, though it's been around technically since 2008, it is kind of hitting mainstream now. Security, so cybersecurity was a session you guys already had. I assume blockchain was discussed there, but security, blockchain has incredible use cases for security and policy. Um, a lot of governments now are creating legislation and regulation around this kind of technology, and we want to ensure that you are actually informed. I want to throw a few couple examples up um, to start with. So you have government adoption. You see things like Smart Dubai and Estonia actually legislating and including blockchain technology and their government systems and their, their databases and their identity tools. Um, and then you see countries like Venezuela actually issuing their own cryptocurrency. Um, in terms of global crackdown, you see the banning of cryptocurrencies. China's banned Bitcoin several times. And then you also see the SEC regulation in the United States of what are called initial coin offerings, which I will discuss later. But that is the US attempt at protecting consumers. So blockchain 101. Before we talk about blockchain, you have to first understand ledgers. Because when people refer to blockchain, they refer to it as a distributed ledger. Um, now, I really didn't study ledgers growing up. It wasn't part of my education system, but we use ledgers every day. Um, and we've used ledgers since the beginning of time. And so in giving a brief history of ledgers, you start with ancient Sumerians who had tablets and they recorded transactions and they recorded who held what and when and where in their own system. And over the years, the ledger has evolved. Um, it you know, became digitized. And then we had what we call the rise of professional ledger keepers. So these are things such as accountants, you know, whose job, sole job is to ensure that ledgers are updated accurately. You have lawyers who often you know, will negotiate between who owns what and who gave what to whom when. Um, and then you have bankers. And whereas bankers really were designed to serve as the intermediary protecting people's funds and facilitating transactions. Again, ledgers store and record transactions. So you have the rise of these professional ledger keepers as desired occupations. And what you began to see in the 20th and 21st century was the rapidly growing wealth gap, right? We, in some of your countries, and I know in the United States where I'm from, you see bankers, accountants, lawyers really starting to become more prominent, holding six-figure salaries. Um, and you see that these, these desired occupations and the control of ledgers really started to create a divide. And then in 2008, we had the global financial crisis. Um, people blame a lot of different parties. Many people blame banks. Um, but what you see there was a misuse of ledgers. Right? There was a ledger that was fudged, maybe repeatedly, and that led to misinformation, which led to the global financial crisis. And then you see Satoshi Nakamoto. So this is where Bitcoin um, comes into the picture. And in 2008, a person 
or group of people named Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper. And this was the first white paper demonstrating blockchain technology. So first understand ledgers to understand blockchain. So blockchain is, again, these are very, very dense slides. I won't read every word on them for your sake, but I will distribute them after so you can read as much as you want for as long as you want. But blockchain is a distributed database that is inherently resistant to attacks and fraud. And so the value proposition really are four things, reducing costs, increasing revenue, reducing risk, and increasing speed and transparency. And so, again, not only do you have to understand ledgers, but you have to understand databases. And what is a database? A database essentially can function as a ledger, but where a ledger stores or records transactions, a database can actually hold those transactions and the materials in those transactions. And so the key components of a blockchain is that it's immutable, which means that once it's entered into a blockchain, so when you have a ledger, you can think of it as simply as, you know, an entry system of a date, an item, and who entered it. Like, visually, if you need to see that, I'm a big visual person. And once it's entered into the ledger and it's secured by the blockchain, which will go into the technology, it can't be edited or deleted. And this is huge because, again, as I mentioned, you know, there have been many a scandal over the fudging, the, the changing, the mislabeling of transactions for the benefit of a party over another. And it's decentralized. So decentralization meaning that the way the blockchain is set up and the computers, as I'll discuss, is that each computer on a blockchain holds the ledger. So it's not as though there's a central ledger held within one secure system or one database that if it were to be attacked, that it would crash and you would lose everything. If something is on a blockchain, the more parties that are involved on a blockchain, the more secure it is because it's held and distributed across the world. And then it's cryptographically secure. So the foundational technologies behind Bitcoin aren't new. Blockchain itself is revolutionary. Um, however, it uses very old school techniques of cryptography, which is essentially just highly complex math um, to secure um, the, the, the transactions and the entries. So what you'll hear a lot when people talk about blockchain is decentralization, the decentralized world, we like to call it um, at my company. And why decentralization matters is incredibly important because this is inherently built into the foundation of the technology. Um, and so when you read the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, he writes about how this will fundamentally change how we operate in our economies around the world. And giving power back to the individual, back to communities to decide how they want to allocate resources and allowing people to be accountable and hold entities accountable that once weren't accessible by individuals. So inclusive, robust, uncensorable, egalitarian, um, again, are four key points. Um, the words in themselves are pretty explanatory, so I won't have to explain those too much. Now, when people hear blockchain, they often hear Bitcoin. Um, the two are not the same. Blockchain is the underlying technology behind Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first use case, the first public use case of blockchain technology. So I think it's important that when you as leaders, you know, are discussing this technology that you're able to separate the two. Um, a lot of times we're seeing um, blockchain become demonized as cryptocurrencies are being demonized. However, blockchain is simply the technology behind it. Bitcoin and the way Bitcoin has been used or other cryptocurrencies have been used um, should be considered separately. So Bitcoin, was, like I said, was the first use case. So when you think about cryptocurrency, what a cryptocurrency is, is just electronic money that's protected through cryptography. Again, very complex math. And it's issued by a decentralized network. So to take a step back and explain in a very, very simple way what Bitcoin actually was, was you had a blockchain, so you had a ledger. And people would enter into the ledger very complex math problems, so cryptography. And as soon as there would be a race by the computers, and this is a, called a consensus mechanism, which I'll explain. And as soon as an entry was correctly verified, the owner of that computer, that computer would be awarded a Bitcoin. So that was the way that the, the cryptocurrency was created. So the more transactions that were verified on the platform, the more Bitcoin that person would get. So it started as the people who held the computers who were solving the very complex math problems held the Bitcoins, and then those people began to sell them, to use them, to give them to exchanges, and then now anyone can buy a Bitcoin on Coinbase if you're in the States. Um, but Bitcoin essentially was the reward for correctly using a blockchain. And the intrinsic value of a cryptocurrency and I'll say intrinsic because I think we're seeing the, the cryptocurrency bubble start to pop a little bit, is dependent upon utility, as with any currency. 
a currency is only as great as its use. Um, and so with cryptocurrency, what we're seeing with people buying Bitcoin and buying Ether and buying Litecoin and buying Dogecoin and all these cryptocurrencies is that they're not being circulated, they're not being used, and so their value right now is just speculation, right? So that's why you're seeing the wild fluctuations in price. Um, and those who believe that, that the cryptocurrencies are meant to be used as normal currency believe that the bubble will inherently burst. So if you're not watching that, I would keep an eye on that because right now it is just highly highly speculative market. Um, and it eliminates a double spend problem essentially where that is, you know, again, I can't fake that I gave you $20 when I actually didn't, therefore I'm keeping the $20. You never get $20, but the ledger says that. Using a blockchain, um, the transaction is visible to all in the system, therefore you immediately actually have the $20. Um, and then blockchain technology, as I mentioned, um, it groups crypto cryptographically signed transaction into blocks, validates the blocks, and links the blocks. So blockchain is literally just that. Um, it is a chain of blocks. So when transactions are verified by a computer, like the entries are verified by a computer, it forms a block that is timestamped. And then the next series of transactions must be attached to that prior block. So that's where you see the timestamp, that's where you see the legacy of transactions and the history and the record keeping. This is a very, very small font. This is a brief history of blockchain. It stops at 2016, so clearly it is outdated. Um, we can't keep up with the updates, um, but 2008, as I mentioned, Toshi Nakamoto introduced block, or Bitcoin, and um, in 2013, you start to see Ethereum be created, um, which I'll get into what Ethereum is, and announced. And then, you know, 2015, you have Hyperledger, um, and there have been many, many more since. So blockchain, and, and this was in the description as well, distributed ledger technology. Distributed ledgers are independent computers, referred to as nodes, um, that record and share and transact within these ledgers. And not all distributed ledger technologies are blockchains. Um, not all have the inherent block nature. So when you think about distributed ledger technology, you may see DLT um, used interchangeably with blockchain, um, but there is a bit of a slight difference. And in looking at different DLTs, you have things such as, things you may have heard of or may not have heard of, such as Hyperledger, Quorum, R3, Ethereum. These are all some of the most significant players in the digital ledger technology space. So Ethereum is unique in that it's the first fully programmable blockchain. Um, so what this means is that with the Bitcoin blockchain, what the Bitcoin blockchain can do is issue Bitcoin. Whereas Ethereum, you can actually program on top of it. So you think of it as, as a software backend where you can build web applications, mobile applications. Um, we like to call it Web 3.0. So right now, what Web 2.0 is, is you have the internet. The internet is everywhere. It's on our phones. It's on our computers. We have social media. We're interconnected. Um, but at the same time, Web 2.0 is run by a few different agencies, right? A few different companies control Web 2.0 and control our data, control how and when we operate. We're seeing you know, the end of net neutrality, potentially. So that's Web 2.0. Ethereum is trying to create Web 3.0, which is essentially decentralized internet, um, which is a really, really exciting in which using blockchain technology, um, people can self-govern the internet, can self-govern the data that they use on the internet and how it's, how it's distributed, how it's used by others. Um, and most of the technology, you'll see a lot of the blockchain technology applications that you see are built on Ethereum, again, because it's fully programmable. It's one of the most developer-friendly blockchains to build on top of using a coding language called Salinity. But again, that's very, very technical, um, which I won't get too into. Um, how are we doing? That was a lot. Are we, are we okay? Are we smiling? Okay, some smiles. <laughs> if it's too much, just like, you know, tell me to stop or keep going. Um, so what is Ethereum? Again, like I said, it's an immutable ledger as we covered ledgers. It's decentralized, it's cryptographically secure. And the unique thing about Ethereum is that it actually uses and can deploy something called smart contracts, which I will get into. So that's a, a little teaser into smart contracts. So the evolution of blockchain protocols, again, it began with Bitcoin. You move into crypto assets, which can include a cryptocurrency, but essentially a crypto asset is a digitally represented physical asset. 
Um, so with a cryptocurrency, it's a digital currency. Um, you can also have a digital version or representation of land ownership, of a land title, of your identity. Um, and so these, these digital representations are referred to as crypto assets. And these are what you see on a digital ledger, blockchain. And then a smart contract can execute business logic. There are a few different kind of blockchain infrastructures. So you have public, which is what the Bitcoin blockchain was and what it was intentionally originally designed to be, um, which means anyone can join as what they refer to as a trustless participant. So with a public blockchain, if you go to something called Etherscan, for example, you can see every single transaction that takes place on the Ethereum blockchain as it happens. So you aren't seeing who's transacting, you're seeing what we call their public key. So it's not a name, it's not a single identifier, it's just a public version of their private identity. And you can see every single interaction that takes place. So you'll look at it, it'll be a string of numbers and letters, but what the public blockchain was designed to do was to allow anyone who's on the network to see when things are happening. That's the transparency piece of it. Um, you have consortium blockchains, which are shared permission blockchains. So essentially a group, of businesses or a group of governments can get together and say, we want to share information, we want to build a blockchain together, but we don't necessarily want everyone to have access to it or everyone to be able to like, put a computer on the node um, and update it. So you can have a consortium blockchain and then you can have a, what, a private blockchain, which essentially is you are creating a highly permissioned blockchain. Um, so you're using the benefits of the technology, perhaps a bit weak on the transparency side because you get to decide who can see what is happening on the blockchain, but it's still using the distributed ledger technology. So this is going to get little technical, um, so I will keep it high level. Um, I tried to simplify it as much as possible. Jorge was like, trim it down, one point, try to keep it high level. So I, I tried my best, um, but I, I live, breathe, eat blockchain. So if it's too much, um, someone give me like a scared face and I will ease up. Um, so the core components of a blockchain. So when we say node, we also mean computer. So like I said earlier, all of the work being done for a blockchain, to secure a blockchain, to enter into a ledger, is done by computers. So I know we talk about Google and Amazon having mining centers or data centers. Um, blockchains are similar. It's not a human doing intense math. It's a, just a hyper strong computer. Um, use, depending on the consensus mechanism, it might use a lot of energy or it might use money, um, but they're just doing complex math problems day and night. And so when we talk about a distributed ledger or being distributed on a variety of nodes, that just means a variety of computers. And so these are the, the, the short steps, um, again, hyper simple, to you know, entering into a transaction. Um, so you have a transaction that can be submitted. So someone is on a blockchain, they want to enter into a transaction, they type a transaction in, and then the nodes send any transactions to all of the other nodes and then those nodes send on to other nodes and go across, you know, this is like a nice, neat little pattern, but really it's moving at light speed crazy. Um, and then eventually all the nodes have a copy. At this stage, just because all the nodes have a copy doesn't mean it's processed or approved. So the entry piece is part one. And then the verification piece, the processing piece, is when they get put into the block of transactions. And then each node processes the same transaction in the block. So that's what's called consensus. So a consensus mechanism is essentially all of the computers agree that this transaction is true. Um, so in reaching consensus, one of the nodes has to be the leader. Um, therefore, that's a usually a computer. Again, depending on the consensus mechanism, they're essentially fighting to verify that transaction. And then once the transaction has been approved, because every node processes the same transactions, every single node has that history of that transaction. So that's where the decentralization, the multiple copies, the, the security comes into play. So if a single node goes down, or if a new node connects to the network, they load the history. Um, in a consensus mechanism, or in an attack, people ask, is it actually really that secure if one node goes down, or what happens if half of the nodes go down, or what happens if half of the nodes are taken over by bad actors who want to, again, fudge, um, wow, that was quick, <laughs> um, who want to fudge uh, in, um, a ledger. Um, we call that a 51% attack, so it is possible because a consensus mechanism is essentially a majority vote that this transaction was 
right. Um, a 51% attack can be if there are actors who want to join together to essentially overtake a blockchain, that can happen. Um, but again, that takes immense amounts of energy or money depending on the consensus mechanism. Really quick, a smart contract essentially is an if this, then that statement. Um, so you can program into, you know, a computer programmer can program into a blockchain. If on May 9th, Ariana will get $100 from her whatever, her friend who owed her $100. If you build that into the smart contract and build that into the blockchain and you sync up bank accounts, it will happen instantaneously without a human having to go in and send the $100. Okay, I'm gonna breathe through this to get to, again, you'll get these um, afterwards. But to talk a little bit about security, um, with these really highly technical pieces, the average person won't know that they're using a blockchain. That is the idea. Um, good user experience, good user design. It will seem as though you're using an app on your iPhone. Right now I have two apps that are blockchain apps on my iPhone. They function just normally. Um, the only thing different is the back end. So when we talk about hashing functions and digital signatures and cryptography, um, that really is only relevant to those designing the actual blockchain. Um, this will overwhelm a user and we don't encourage people to try to explain this to users every day. So tokens are a hot topic right now. Cryptocurrencies are a hot topic right now and we, as a social impact team, encourage people to focus on utility tokens. So a security token, um, as defined by the Howey test, is, think of it as buying a stake in a company. So we hear about initial coin offerings, we hear about ICOs, where someone says, buy a piece of my company, my new blockchain company, and you, know, you can see 300% return you know, in the next year. That's a security token. Um, a utility token, a cryptocurrency, and you know, what a cryptocurrency was designed to be, again, is based upon utility. It's essential to the system. So a, an example of a utility token in a blockchain system is I create a digital world, um, a blockchain app in which, you know, to play um, a video game, you know, there's a thing called CryptoKitties. To, to play, you have to have um, a token that allows you access to the website. So that token is necessary for the use of your platform. Um, it's not something you would just sit on and hope you'll make a lot of money off one day. Um, and so again, don't force a token into the system. You can have a blockchain system without having a token, without having a cryptocurrency. It could just be a better way to operate, which confuses a lot of people. Again, Bitcoin and blockchain, think of them as separate. So how can it be used? So this is dipping into use cases, a little bit higher level. Um, if your process or, or an organization or an ecosystem has any of the four issues, blockchain, most likely can be used for your system. So when you talk about obscurity, right, this could be um, you know, no transparency, fragmented systems for keeping records. Think of this as voting, right? If there's an issue in which voting is kept in a black box, it's behind closed doors, you can't really tell if people are being truthful and, and what numbers come out, you can use a blockchain there. And efficiency, if there are processes that have middlemen that are slowing things down, you can use blockchain. Low trust, again, you may not trust the entity that you're interacting with, but you have to interact with them. Therefore, you want to force them into transparency there, so you can trust them. And then poor coordination. Um, if materials are just scattered all over the place, a blockchain can help bring that together. So an obscurity, um, again, a demand for transparency and streamlined processes. An example of this is the legacy healthcare system. Um, and so with information being scattered across, um, there may be information that an insurer needs to know, that a healthcare provider knows, that only a primary care provider knows, that maybe only an individual knows. Therefore, how do we create a system that all of those parties can interact together for the sake of someone's health? And efficiency, um, this is an interesting example of a credit card company, right? So there are middlemen that were created simply to facilitate transactions. So a credit card company, when you use it at certain places, um, charge you a fee. So the vendor, may not get the full $100 that a person spends, right? So that's usually why, you know, when I go to a coffee shop and they charge me $2 for using a credit card rather than cash, um, the vendor isn't seeing that $2. That $2 is going to the credit card company because the credit card company has inserted themselves as the arbiter of uh, the transaction. Whereas in a blockchain system, the consumer, and this is, again, these, are, these numbers will change depending on the kind of blockchain, but the consumer in theory would pay $100, the vendor would get $100, and this 10 cents that you're seeing is what's called the gas cost. So that's the cost that it's required to run the computer to run the transaction. What we, as a social impact team, when we're designing systems, and what you see with a lot of other systems, do is 
the blockchain provider will actually cover the cost of that 10 cents, right? So when a consumer is interacting with your platform, they're not actually fronting that 10 cents. They're just paying the $100. So and you, you can think of remittances. Say someone wants to send $100 through your blockchain remittance system. They send $100. Their family member on the other side actually gets the $100. There is not a penalty cost. Per coordination, um, the example here is that um, climate change. So we talk about carbon cutting and that you know it's important to track who uses how much carbon, when and where, and it's important for all of us to know how that's working, how these efforts are going to cut carbon. And it only works if everyone participates or else there could be someone just blowing carbon somewhere without anyone else having to hold them accountable. However, like I said, carbon trading, tree planting, fish tracking, there was an interesting World Wildlife Fund um, tuna tracking project that just came out um, are all ways that these valuable and communally shared resources can be tracked and, and those who use it can be held accountable. And looking at blockchain opportunities, um, again, a lot of different words, um, but essentially these are all different business use cases that can be disrupted by blockchain. So asset tokenization, again, taking something physical, making it digital, um, custody and escrow, holding funds, provenance and tracking. Um, supply chain is a really, really low-hanging fruit in the blockchain space. So when you think of supply chain, it's understanding um, who entered what into the system, if it was delivered, if it was delivered properly, what condition it was delivered in, who signed off on it. And if you think about, for example, a, a coffee plant, right? The farmer may not have the most technically innovative system, therefore they may be entering something in on paper. What happens if that paper gets lost or gets thrown away or burned? Well, the person picking up that coffee therefore has to guess perhaps what you know, the, the coffee you know, weight may be or who signed off on it. And there can be these little mistakes that line up when a, a supply chain system isn't all displayed together that can lead to an eventually harmful result such as we see you know, with food poisoning or with harmful chemicals that perhaps were touched. Um, and so supply chain is, like I said, a huge use case. Accounting and reconciliation, this goes back to just a simple ledger. Um, this will make accounting very, very simple. It, it scares accountants a little bit how simple this will make it um, because the idea is that there won't, it, the system won't be so complicated that you need to hire someone to do it for you. Um, so a blockchain is here to make things simpler, more transparent, easier to use. Um, digital identity is another big use case. Um, so creating a digital identity in our, in our ever digital world that you can interact with on a variety of platforms um, that you control. And real-time transactions, micropayments and funding, automated execution. These are just some examples of business operating models um, that could be impacted. Um, so again, decentralized and distributed. The idea here is that those in the party and those that are using the technology will govern the system. They're not dependent upon one person saying, this is how we're going to do it and deal with it. Um, those in the party can vote and can decide on how to use the system. And you know, the last thing I'll say, the la these two pieces are about social impact, which we'll hear about um, on the projects following, which I'm really excited to hear about. Um, but what I'll say in closing, and I'll actually just wrap up the slides, is that Blockchain, um, for a lot of people, and the way of doing distributed data systems and distributed voting, decentralized voting, et cetera, is really a sociological and, and philosophical way that the world is going to change in how it operates, right? Giving power back to an individual, um, back to groups, back to communities, will change how we've operated as you know, these, these larger entities who we've looked to that we depend upon um, are loosening their power. And so I think when you are thinking about designing a blockchain system, empowerment is, is key, um, transparency is key, and really what you're doing when you're, you're using a blockchain system is that you're providing people with the ability to define how they interact with the world around them. And that's really huge because it hasn't really happened before. Again, as larger entities have said, this is how you're going to use a tool, and I'm going to control how you use a tool um, because I know best, right? And we're returning to a place where people decide what's best for them um, and I think that's really exciting. And so it can get really technical and cryptocurrencies can, can clog your, your brain when you think of blockchain, but I think there is a huge light at the end of the tunnel in terms of blockchain. And so I think it's an opportunity to get creative in how um, we design systems to help people and bring those people in to help design the systems as well because they understand how their communities operate themselves. So 